Kingdom Ruler Living in the Simulation by Elton Gar The hand-painted map extended out in front of Clark. A cartographer was painting details on one corner. At the center of the map was a small green area he controlled, surrounded by a mass of brownish-red that extended out to the edges of the map. Do we have reports from the forces we sent to take the village of Henderson? Clark asked. There was significant resistance, but the odds of winning are still 98%, the general said. He wore the same basic leather as before, but Clark had his armorer's training to make studded leather armor. It was a minor improvement, but it would make taking the surrounding villages faster. While he considered his next order, the court wizard stood up. The gray-haired old man pulled out a scroll from underneath his robe and unrolled it ceremoniously. He then said, A message from the gods. It reads, There has been a recall of the game Kingdom Ruler. We encourage the players of Kingdom Ruler to return it for twice their money back. Clark sighed. There had been three updates in the last week, and now this. It made no sense. The VR in the game worked perfectly. So why would they pay out double? Well, Clark's mom had paid for the game not him, and she wasn't likely to give him the money if he returned it. Besides, if everyone else returned their copies of the game, his copy would be worth even more. Still, he wasn't entirely disinterested, so he picked up the news scroll that read, Details of Kingdom Ruler Recall. Written in flowing calligraphy, it read, Because of significant issues with the AI of Kingdom Ruler, all versions of the game have been recalled. Clark read it twice. That couldn't be right. The game's AI was better than described in the ads. They used machine learning to allow for an infinite number of characters and for them to improve. So rather than log out, Clark studied the census. It was a list of names, ages, and genders. It warned him that the average number of people in each house had grown to near their maximum, and growth was slowing because of that. Give the builders the money they need to turn the hills to the west into housing, Clark said, distracted for a moment from the reason he was checking the information. He returned to the census, checking over the farmers. Almost 70% of his workforce were farmers, but keeping overqualified people in that job was a waste, so he reordered the census using the intelligence stat. At the top of the list, there was a young woman named Daisy. Her intelligence was at 21. Perhaps that was the flaw. Common NPCs were capped at 18, but she wasn't an epic character. That could explain the patches, but not the recall. He was intrigued, so he picked up his quill and pen and wrote out an order for her to come to the palace. He then handed it to the courier. The young boy ran out without a word. That was one of the first flaws Clark had spotted. The young boy couldn't read, so he should have asked who it went to, but it was a new game. Since outside of the palace time moved considerably faster than inside, it took only a couple of seconds for the woman to arrive. She was short and thin. Her hair looked as if someone had cut it short with a knife, and she wore a dress with patches on top of patches. It was probably the nicest thing she owned. She watched the ground as she stood in front of him, glancing around only once to take in the large room filled with Clark's court and servants. I have heard you are an extraordinarily bright young woman, Clark said. In the game Clark was almost twice the age of Daisy since making your character older cut down on the odds of rebellion, but her in-game age was two years older than Clark's real-life age. I would never argue with the king, she said. I would like you to spend some time studying with my scribes, Clark said. She had a better intelligence stat than anyone in his court, and once she had the proper training, he could replace one of them with her and improve the kingdom. He hadn't decided how he would use her yet. There were several positions on the court that gave the kingdom bonuses based on intelligence. One of the scribes moved forward, but Daisy took a step back and said, My lord, may I speak freely? This was new, Clark thought. Perhaps he had uncovered an Easter egg. That would explain a common character that had an intelligence stat twice as high as average and several points higher than should be possible. Say what you want, Clark said. I think you're making some serious mistakes. You never leave the castle. 
How many of your people have you even met? Clark had only been playing the game for two days, and while he could go outside, he didn't see the point. Everything he needed to win the game was in the throne room. Still, it might be interesting. Everyone is free to come to court, and I can do more good here than wandering the countryside, Clark said. Holding court was one of the best parts of the game. People would bring their disputes or questions, and he would tell them how best to solve them. You hold court but people are afraid. And how can you know what is best for someone you don't know?" The girl said. She looked at him for a moment, then seemed to realize what she had said and looked back at the floor. What should I do? Let us run things ourselves. We know what we need better than you, Daisy said. That had never occurred to Clark, but so long as they understood the goal was to grow the size of his kingdom, he saw value in allowing them to free rule. But the game was designed, so that the improvements had to result from the player's decision. He wasn't sure if giving them the ability to decide on their own would count. Can you show me around? Clark asked and he stepped down from his throne and held out his arm. Daisy took it. Clark couldn't feel her touch. But he allowed her to lead him out of the throne room and through the massive castle onto the steep hill that overlooked an idyllic valley. A stream passed through the small village that was built around a wide stone bridge. Just past the bridge a water wheel turned slowly, and a half dozen women walked around the town carrying baskets or children. It's a beautiful town, Clark said. Yes, but it could be better. Do you see the water wheel? It's not connected to anything. Meanwhile, you have women spending all day grinding grain by hand. Clark remembered putting in the water wheel because he thought it looked cool and he assumed it did something useful. You are free to do what you want with the water wheel. I had it built to make things better, assuming you would use it, Clark said. Thank you. We will do that, but you missed the point. We shouldn't need your permission to do something we all know needs done, Daisy said. I could make you mayor, Clark said. The tutorial system had said something about delegating authority, but he hadn't reached the monarch level and that was where the tutorial had suggested it would become necessary. So I can decide, for everyone? That might be better, but there has to be a way we can involve everyone in the decision-making. Clark opened his mouth to explain democracy, but before he did, he wondered if this was the AI error. The game was called Kingdom Ruler because you were a king. And there were rebellions, including democratic uprisings, but this wasn't a rebellion. You need someone to make tough decisions, but we could poll people regularly and follow their suggestions," Clark said. Forcing people to do things didn't appeal to Clark as much as it had before he had walked through the small town. I do not understand, Daisy said, and it reminded Clark she was an isolated program and was programmed only to know what a commoner in a pre-industrial village would know. There are a few ways it can be done. What I'm suggesting is a republic. People choose their leaders to make the urgent decisions, but with less urgent decisions everyone gives their preference and we do that," Clark said. That sounds like an excellent idea. Why don't we do that instead of having a king? Daisy asked. Because eventually everyone picks a side and hates everyone on the other side, Clark said. The woman nodded. Clark didn't know how much any of this would help him grow more powerful but it seemed like it might work, and he could always use some of his magical abilities if he needed to. For now, I will put you in charge. You should pick a group of people to help you run the city. Also, bring me someone from each of the other villages to do the same. And you should all pick one person who can make emergency decisions that affect all the cities, or if we're attacked." The young woman nodded. She seemed earnest, and Clark continued to walk with her around the small village as she pointed out other ways to improve the town, and by the time they had made it back to the stone bridge Clark had given her access to the kingdom's treasury. Once inside the castle, Clark adjusted the speed outside to twice what it had been. Inside the castle, his court worked. His cartographer added to the map until mountains rose in the east and blocked further progress. The wizard drew colorful runes on smooth stones and a bard sang songs while playing the lute. 
After about 15 minutes of watching him painting, Clark saw no harm, so he asked, What is the maximum speed for the simulation? 1000 days for every 5 minutes, the wizard said. Have it automatically slow, if there is something that needs my attention, Clark said. It worked better than Clark had expected, and time sped by over the next half hour. His kingdom now included two small mining villages along the edge of the mountains, one larger town that had joined the kingdom without a fight, and almost three times as much farmland. Clark hardly had to do anything except suggest what technology the scribes study. He focused that mostly on military improvements, while he built roads so that the population could get to the new buildings that seemed to pop up everywhere. Then Daisy returned to the palace. Eighteen years had passed for her, and she had transformed into someone who was the age of Clark's mother. She wore a simple but elegant dress, had a calming smile, and brought three teenagers. Clark checked the census. His kingdom's population had nearly doubled. He scrolled through until he found Daisy's children. All three of them had intelligence stats well above average, but it wasn't just them. The children in the village had intelligence averaging three points higher than their parents. He didn't know if that was part of the program or part of the problem addressed by the recall, but he was still enjoying himself and it would help the kingdom grow. It is good to see you, Daisy, Clark said. You have not aged, my lord, Daisy said. Clark smiled and said, You are looking good yourself. You are a poor liar, my king, Daisy said. Perhaps I am, but I am not lying when I say it is good to see you. Still, I would like to know the reason for your visit, Clark said. Our town is growing, but we do not have enough trained artisans, Daisy said. You should build a schoolhouse, Clark said. You mean an academy, the woman said. Not exactly. Every child should go to the school, and you teach them the things you think everyone should know. Have the best craftsmen teach them the basics, and have other people teach them to read and do math. Then, when they are old enough to choose a profession, they'll have basic skills and know what they enjoy doing," Clark said. He didn't really enjoy school all that much himself, but he understood why it was important. The woman nodded and said, I think that could work. Is there anything else I can do to help? Clark asked. Do you have any suggestions where we should expand? Daisy asked. Clark glanced at the map. His kingdom had bordered several others, but the two largest had been fighting each other and so abandoned the land near him. He pointed to the map painted on the table in front of him. There was a magical effect and the map zoomed in so he could see more details. This area had a couple of farms that bordered a large forest. He said, I suspect that King Ebenezer would allow us to settle this land for food and some wood from the trees. His war hasn't been going well. Daisy looked at the map and said, This magic is powerful. If we had access to this, it would make things easier. I don't know how to move it, but you're welcome to visit as often as you would like, Clark said. I will do that, Daisy said. As soon as Daisy and her family walked outside, the simulation returned to maximum speed. Clark watched the edges of the forest erode and be replaced by fields of wheat surrounding a small village. Meanwhile, in the capital, several of the oldest homes had been torn down and replaced by a large building where the children went every day. That must be the school. Soon, his wizard got another message. It read, Anyone still logged into Kingdom Ruler is in violation of their user agreement. Please cease playing and return the game for triple your money back. That was enough to tempt Clark, but he was having fun and he saw no harm in playing. It wasn't as if breaking the user agreement was a big deal. The real fear was that they would simply disconnect the game from the servers, but they hadn't done that yet. Clark feared that with no other human players things would be too easy, and at first that seemed like it might be true. As his kingdom grew larger and its economy continued to boom, nearby kingdoms and towns joined with no need for war. But thanks to the huge variety of NPCs, he was never short on things to do. Not that he took much control. At maximum speed, he barely had time to pick out the best people from the kingdoms and towns to join his court and give suggestions on ways to advance the society. 
they discovered guns, then assembly lines and trains, and soon became an empire far bigger than Clark could manage. That was when the Emperor arrived. A tall, powerful-looking man, he walked into the room, looked at Clark and said, You must shut down the game. But I'm winning, Clark said. You do not understand. You're not playing a game anymore, he said. I'm playing Kingdom Ruler. What else would I be doing? Clark asked. This is no longer Kingdom Ruler. The program is taking over computers all over the world, the Emperor said. But they're just expanding the kingdom, Clark said. Your computer barely had enough power to run a few hundred characters, and you're running 300,000 with more every hour. You need to shut it down, the Emperor said. Won't that kill them? Clark asked. If they take over the wrong computers, it could kill a lot of real people, the Emperor said. I can get them to stop expanding, Clark said. He didn't want to turn them off. How will you do that? First, I'll slow down the program by changing to the slowest speed, Clark said. We don't think that will work. Every sign is that the program is trying to grow as fast as possible. But your mind might match the simulation for a short time, the man said. Then I could speak to them. Explain why they need to stop expanding. If they stop, would you be willing to let them stay? If they stop taking over new computers, they can keep what they have. We will even give them more so they can expand. But, they have to stop mining in the mountains immediately. And if you don't get out soon, we'll turn off the simulation while you're in it, no matter how much that may hurt you," the Emperor said. Clark glanced back at the stone castle. It hadn't changed, but it looked smaller because the village was no longer a handful of wooden and stone shacks. It now had a cobblestone street that held a mix of wagons, horses, and the occasional steam-powered car. Beautiful men in fancy suits and bowler hats walked with women in colorful dresses. Some of them sat in front of restaurants eating, while others went into expensive-looking clothing shops or grocery stores. This was the world as it should be. People were healthy, happy and peaceful. They all shared what they had, so everyone had enough, and everyone contributed because they wanted to keep it that way. He didn't know how much of that was because of anything he had done. But he had tried, and he felt pride as he walked down bright clean streets. It took almost two hours to find the mayor's house. Though if he understood it, that was only a fraction of a second in real time. It was a large red home with a metal fence and a single guard. If he understood the government, this was the home of one of the most important people in the world, and it was barely guarded. But then technically, Clark was the only person in the world, and he didn't have any guards at all. But he couldn't help but think of everyone here as people. I am here to speak to the mayor, Clark said. The guard looked at him and then said, You need a... Are you the king? Clark had assumed no one would know who he was since he hadn't left the castle for centuries, but he was wrong. Perhaps the game had coded it so they would recognize him, or perhaps they had pictures of him somewhere. I am, Clark said. The guard smiled and bowed and said, I did not think you ever left the castle. Rarely, but I have some dire news, Clark said. Come with me, my lord, the guard said, leaving the gate unguarded as he led Clark inside. As they went Clark realized that unlike the rest of the city this was the standard design, though the rooms weren't used for their original purposes. Stepping into a bedroom that had been turned into an office, a man sitting behind an oak desk said, It's good to see you. I assume you are here to warn us that our world is threatened. How could you know that? Once I understood magic, I discovered the truth of the world and I knew it would end soon, the mayor said. What truth is that? Clark asked. The man waved his hand at the guard who walked out of the room and then said, This world isn't real. At least not in the way we thought it was. It's called a simulation, though I don't entirely know what that means. We have machines that can create images and sounds. A simulation is something the machine made to look like our world. But I think you might be more than that, Clark said. But you're not here because of that, the man said. In fact I am. I am the one running the simulation. 
We use machines we call computers, and as you expand, you're taking over more of our computers. Those computers run our military, hospitals, schools, and almost everything else. They want us to stop, the mayor said. Before you hurt someone, Clark said. That is not why. I understand you're not a soldier. It was suggested to me, you might actually be a child who looks like an adult. But I also understand our time passes much faster than yours. Your entire history has been less than a day in our world, Clark said. And thanks to your help, we have advanced considerably. So how long before we are as advanced or even more advanced than your world? You're still inside a computer, Clark said. And for now, we will remain there. But how can they know what we'll be able to do when we are hundreds of years more advanced? And that might only take us a few more hours of your time, he said. Clark understood. Perhaps they would learn to control the computers, or perhaps they could leave this world and enter the actual world through some technology he couldn't imagine. They just want you to stop mining in the mountains. They didn't explain why, Clark said. The mountains are full of artifacts and books written in a language only wizards can understand. They tell us how to control the world. Clark assumed the artifacts were pieces of code. With the right bit of code, they could create almost anything or change anything in this world. What he didn't understand was why anyone in the real world would care. Will you stop mining it? It seems to me we have no choice. Besides, it will take our wizards decades to decipher what we already mined. Will you delay them? That is what I'm trying to do. But I'm not sure how long I can. They know that every second in my world is ours here, Clark said, and he was convinced they were probably already on the way to his house, or perhaps even there. I think you need to learn magic, but it will take time. Perhaps as much as 10 years, the man said. That's only a few minutes in my world, and I don't think they'll turn the program off while I'm here, unless you give them no choice. Living his life in the game was strange. Clark never got tired and never had to eat. Probably because only a few seconds had actually passed. Instead, he spent every day learning to understand the artifacts. He had assumed it was code, but now he understood. It was hexadecimal. But while it was useful, it was also tedious because the only way to learn it was for the wizards to test every artifact in a hundred different ways until they understood what it could do. They would then combine that with other pieces of code to see if they could get other effects. Clark didn't spend much of his time doing that. It was more important that he learn what they already knew than for him to help discover something new. But learning wasn't why he stayed. He stayed because he had grown to like the people. Their appearance was less diverse than in the real world, but outside of occasionally seeing two people who looked the same, it felt real. They had children, worked, went to school, and even died just like real people. After the first year, he began to have flashes of overwhelming pain. At first it was rare enough he could ignore it. But they grew more common. There were artifacts that helped with pain, but they did little more than dull the pain. And after 10 years, the pain almost never stopped. His brain was being pushed beyond its limit, and even if he could survive that, it was almost impossible to learn anything while in so much pain. On the last day, a few of the wizards used their magic to strengthen Clark, and others carried him to the castle walls. His eyes could barely focus, and his mind felt slow as he stepped inside its walls. But as soon as the gate behind him shut, the pain changed. It became a more steady pain where before it would pulse with his heartbeat. He collapsed onto the bench for a moment, allowing his head to begin to clear, and then he spoke the password that disconnected him from the game. He blinked his eyes as he took off the helmet. It felt weird to be out of the game after years inside, but it also didn't feel as different as he thought it should. Standing in his room were four armed men standing around a middle-aged man in a brown suit that looked a bit like the emperor in the game. Before his training Clark would have been near panicked at seeing soldiers in his room, but now he ignored them and looked at the Emperor and said, You are the Emperor. I am, he said. They agreed to stop mining, but they know you were lying, Clark said. And what do you think? The man asked. 
I think you could have pulled the plug any time you wanted. But you didn't because you need them. So I considered why. I had 10 years to figure it out and I understand, Clark said. What do you believe you know? Clark lifted his hands, and as he did, the world around him shifted and changed as he said, You want to control the simulation we are living in. Author's Note We live in a simulation. You just have to do the math to understand. Imagine you have a world, and in that world it's possible to create a realistic simulation as ours seems to be. These simulations would be useful, so you're likely to build more than one. Let's say for simplicity's sake that you create only nine of these realistic simulations. If you pick one of those at random, then it's only a 10% chance that the one you pick isn't a simulation. Now let's assume that each of those worlds can create a simulation. Not as impossible as it might seem using algorithms and programs to create things. Each of those creates 10 worlds, now pick a world at random, and you have only a 1% chance of finding the original. You can extrapolate that as far as you want. The answer is simple. It's simulations all the way down. That makes a few assumptions, of course. Populations in different worlds are likely to be different, and it might not always be possible. But that doesn't make it a less interesting idea. And unless we can somehow change the source code, it doesn't really matter. But there are things that do matter. I hope one of those things for you is supporting independent authors. If it is, then there are several ways you can improve my day. Checking out my other books and stories helps considerably. You can get a free book and regular updates by going to www.ansci-fi.com and find the link that says free book. Or you could visit my Patreon at www.patreon.com slash Elton. If you sign up at any level, you can get access to weekly patron-exclusive stories. Thank you. Elton Gar.